and welcome to Marxism Today. I'm Red Wagner. Today's episode is on Marxism and advertising. Before we get to advertising, we have a little bit of a journey to take. We're going to start with the basis of capitalism, which is the pursuit of surplus value by the capitalist class. We'll then take a look at how competition comes into this, finally technological innovation, and then we will get to advertising. I want to start with the pursuit of surplus value. Surplus value, of course, being the force that drives capital. So this will be a little bit of a review for those of you who are very familiar with Marxist economics. In Marxist economics, our capitalist begins with a certain amount of money. This is sometimes denoted as M prime. The capitalist goes out and buys two things with this, variable capital and constant capital. Variable capital is the Marxist term for the money spent on wages. In other words, he hires people. He also buys constant capital, which is the Marxist term for all the other things he buys, which includes raw materials, machines, tools, and perhaps a workshop or a place to work. An office building would also apply. The capitalist spends M prime on these two things, variable capital and constant capital. And the only reason the capitalist does this is because by doing that, he will have the workers work with the tools and the machines on the raw materials he supplied to make commodities, which he then can sell for more money than he started with. Why more money? Because if it was less, then he wouldn't do it. The point of the capitalist, the point for the capitalist, is to make more money than what you start with. And for every production cycle to do this again and again and to get a greater and greater amount of money each time, which you then can reinvest in the cycle and get more at the end of it each time than you put in at the beginning. This more that comes out of it each time, so in other words, the difference between what you start with and what you end with in a production cycle is called surplus value. Marxists represent this with an S. So we start with V and C, we put those together, and then we end up with a value that is equal to V plus C plus S, S being the surplus value. The S is very important here, the surplus value. That's what a capitalist wants to maximize. So if I'm a capitalist and I happen to spend some money on wages and all those other things, and I end up with a greater amount of money, that's good. But it's not enough if other capitalists end up with more S. So if the guy who I'm competing against ends up with more surplus value at the end of the day, that means he's going to hire more workers, he's going to buy more raw materials, he's going to have more commodities on the market, and eventually I'll be driven out of the market by him. So if I care about staying a capitalist, which I would as a capitalist, because that's how I continually make more and more money, this is a pretty nice gig to just buy these things and to get more of the, and to get more money from them then i need to stay competitive which means my rate of profit the amount of money i get compared against the amount of money i spent needs to be a competitive rate in other words i need to be extracting the same amount of surplus value from my workers as all of my competitors are. In fact, if I can extract more than my competitors, then that's good. I might be able to drive them out of the market and then I don't have to worry about their competition anymore. It's less for me to worry about. And competition leads to technological innovation. But why? Why does competition between capitalists lead to new technology? Because capitalists can use technology to increase their surplus value. So there's a variety of different P 
pieces in our equation that can change to help increase surplus value. One piece is that labor could be saved. So the amount spent on V, variable capital, could go down. The amount spent on C could go down. In other words, you might be able to get by with fewer raw materials or with cheaper tools or with a cheaper workspace. However, technology tends to increase the amount of C because the amount spent on technology, which is generally machines, research, development, is all constant capital. So while it might reduce, in some cases, some parts of constant capital, in general, technology is going to increase constant capital. And in fact, when it comes to variable capital, the capitalist hopes to reduce that, but often what the capitalist finds is that it doesn't reduce the amount spent on variable capital, but rather reduce the amount of variable capital per unit of output. Which leads me to the third piece, what technology most often does in practice is increase the output. So the capitalist may not save very much on variable capital, may not save much on wages. The capitalist probably spends more on constant capital because he had to invest in the technology. However, what the capitalist gets out of it is a much greater number of units, more stuff. So if the capitalist makes automobiles, he's got many, many more cars when he uses this new technology. Or if the capitalist makes uh, shirts and pants and clothing, then the capitalist has a lot more of those pieces, a lot more of those articles of clothing at the end of a production period than he did before without the technology. So this allows the capitalist to sell more of these items and gain a greater profit because each item that's sold gets him a certain amount of money and any money above what he spent on V and C is S. It's surplus value. So that's how a capitalist can increase surplus value by using technology. But note also that the increased number of units has an effect. And we can look at this both using the idea of supply and demand and using Marx's labor theory of value. What happens when we have more products on the market? This is an increase in supply, which supply and demand tell us leads to a reduction in price. There's more automobiles out there. In order to sell them all, we need to lower the price so that people will buy them. Note that for the first capitalist to adopt this new technology, the effect has not entirely taken place yet. When all of the capitalists adopt this technology, that will be a much greater amount of supply, which will drive prices down even further. So when only one capitalist out of many is doing this, the effect it has is spread over all of the automobiles on the market. So the capitalists who still are using the old technology and not making more will have to lower their prices to compete with this new capitalist. The capitalist that adopts the new technology will get an extra surplus, and those who are stuck with the old technology will find themselves with a shrinking surplus. The same is true when we apply the idea of socially necessary labor. When new technology is adapted, it changes what is socially necessary labor. The amount of labor that is socially necessary to create an automobile with this new technology is lower. If you use the old, outdated technology, your labor isn't entirely socially necessary. In, to a certain degree, it's wasted labor that could have been used more efficiently using the new technology. Because 
less labor time is required to produce the product, that means the value of the product is lowered and therefore has a lower price on the market. Note that the amount of value transferred to the product from constant capital is raised. So the product actually has more value transferred over from the machine that helped make it, from that technology that helped make it, but a much lesser value from the variable capital that was put into it because much less time is required by each individual worker to create that car at the end of the line. That's how technology produces vast amounts of commodities and lowers prices. But now the question is, how do we get from these vast numbers of commodities to advertising? The connecting point here is something called realizing surplus value or valorizing the commodities. In other words, the capitalist can go about his business hiring these workers, buying these machines, adopting this new technology, but at the end of the day, it doesn't do him any good unless he can sell all of his products. What we witnessed earlier, what we just talked about, is that the increased supply is made up for with lowering prices. But eventually, enough commodities can be made by a capitalist system that low prices no longer are enough to sell all of the commodities. Eventually, we get so productive that we make more shoes, shirts, barrels of wheat, whatever. We make more commodities than we can possibly consume. And note that in capitalism, when we say we make more than we can consume, this doesn't mean more than the world needs. It means more than we can sell. So if we make more barrels of wheat than we can sell, that's very different than making more barrels of wheat than people need to not starve. If we have starving people without any money in capitalism, we still have a problem of surplus because we can... The only reason a capitalist makes that wheat is in order to sell it for a profit. For a long time, capitalism didn't need a lot of advertising because it didn't make enough commodities to require advertising. It was in the early 1900s that capitalism finally became productive enough that it made more commodities than it could possibly sell just based on the needs of the people. And this is a funny thought, that people might only buy what they need, because today we live in a world full of advertising, and probably even our parents and grandparents grew up in a world full of advertising. It's very hard to imagine something different when no one alive today has ever experienced anything different. And by different here, I mean a world that's not full of advertising and a world that's not shaped by that advertising that's out there. Maybe now is a good time to go into the things that advertising does. Essentially, what advertising attempts to do is create demand. Now, if you think about it, create demand means it's trying to sell something to someone who didn't think they needed it before. Now, if you're a capitalist trying to sell something, this idea sounds great because it allows you to valorize your commodities. In other words, it allows you to sell them so you can make more money so that you can keep on going with the production process. However, if you're not a capitalist, this idea that you would make demand where it didn't exist before is kind of interesting in the sense that making demand means that you are changing someone's mind. Essentially, advertising is supposed to change people's minds. It's supposed to make them do something that they wouldn't have done otherwise. Now, you can probably already see where I'm about to go with this. There's a lot of things 
that are very helpful when you're trying to do this, when your goal is to make someone do something that they wouldn't have done otherwise. It took a while for capitalists to figure out how to do this. So if you look at early advertisements from the early 1900s, they're very informational. They're talking about how their product is the best product. And they think that if I just supply you with the information, you'll go ahead and buy my commodity. And maybe those worked for a while. But that's very different from advertising today. And actually, uh, the, the switch happened quite a long time ago, still on the earlier half of the century. And if you want to get into the background behind this, uh, you can look into a fellow by the name of Edward Bernays, actually Sigmund Freud's nephew, who played a large part in the developing of the modern advertising industry. Now, my point here isn't to say that Bernays is behind it all and that Bernays created this monster. Really, I think that it would have happened anyway. He just happened to be the guy to do it. If he hadn't have done it, someone else would have. Because it's what the capitalist system needed in order to survive. Because when you're making commodities but you can't sell them, that breaks the circuit of capital. Capitalism will go into crisis when you can't sell them. So you need to find a way to create that demand. And that's exactly what advertising did. Advertising was a way to save capitalism. So how does advertising work today? Today, advertising has a lot to do with psychology. In fact, a lot of modern corporations will keep psychologists on staff in order to help with marketing and targeting their particular audiences that they want to sell to. Essentially, what advertising tries to do is to marry the commodity to some unsellable quality that people desire. If we look at a very simple example, this is just one example out of a million, Nike shoes. Yeah, they're selling a shoe, but if you look at the advertising, you might not even realize that it's a shoe they're trying to sell. What they're really selling, if you look at the advertising, is the idea of athleticism, bravery, fitness, confidence, speed, coolness, or attractiveness think the their tagline just do it has nothing to do with the shoes at all the tagline has to do with all of those other unsellable qualities athleticism bravery fitness and so on why is this why does advertising sell qualities rather than commodities because when it comes to commodities, we're talking about use values. We're talking about the shoe has a particular use value. It's to protect your feet, to support your arches, all these other things. You can have enough shoes, just like you can have enough of any sort of commodity. You can have enough cars, or you can have enough pencils, or you can have enough guitars. But when you're selling something beyond that thing then sometimes you can't have enough of those. So when Nike sells their shoes, they're trying to sell athleticism because no one can have enough athleticism. No one can have enough bravery or enough fitness or enough confidence. The idea is to tie the commodity to an idea that does not have a use value limit. In other words, it tries to instill in the consumer the same thing that it instills in the capitalist, which is an unending drive for something that doesn't have an end. Of course, the capitalist is going for surplus value, and the consumer is enticed to chase after certain ideas or certain pure forms of ideas. But the thing they share in common is that there is no 
end point. There's no point at which you can say, okay, I have enough surplus value or, okay, I have um, enough confidence. And actually, it is possible to think, yeah, I do have enough confidence. So part of advertising is to convince you that without the product, you don't. That without it, you're not attractive, you're not cool, you're not whatever you're searching to be. Maybe smart, I don't know. But the way advertising works is it needs to create a need. And often the way to create that need is to convince you that you are not what you want to be. Or that you're not good enough or whatever in some way. And then what it offers to you is that commodity, which won't actually meet that thing, but they try to make it seem like that in the advertising. And the reason that they don't want to actually meet that need is because then you'd buy that one thing and you'd be set, you'd be good to go. But if you buy it and you feel like it's been met for a little bit, but then you realize that it really hasn't, then you might come back again and buy more and more which is the exact logic that capitalism wants to use. It's the same logic that we just mentioned. The idea that it's never enough, you always have to come back for more. There are a lot of things, a lot more things that we could say about advertising than we've already said. This is a huge topic, and we're only going to be scratching the surface in this episode. But the last thing I want to say about advertising is that it is very pervasive. Today, we see thousands of advertisements in one form or another throughout a given day. In one day, a young person or anyone might see 3,000 to upwards of 10,000 different advertisements, whether it's radio ads, billboards, you know, just uh, TV commercials, whatever they are, product placement, things like that, junk mail even. All of these things are advertisements that are changing our way of life from what it was like before all of these advertisings. Now, many of us grew up in it. In fact, probably all of us grew up in this. But this is a massive change that humans have not always lived like. And additionally, it's not just a nuisance. You know, I, I'm often annoyed by advertising, but to me, it's not just a nuisance. As a Marxist, I see advertising as a piece of capitalist propaganda. You know, it's, it's a, something designed to change my mind to suit the capitalist mode of production. And so I define that as capitalist propaganda. Some people might say that this is a paranoid way of looking at the world, but at the same time, I think it's a legitimate one and that it's a realistic one. So that's something that I like to keep in mind when, whenever I take a step back from my normal day and look at it and see what's happening. And I think with that, we'll end this episode of Marxism Today. Thanks for listening. This has been Marxism in Advertising. This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.